Thank you, and uh, thank you for the nice invitation. Uh, I should start by saying it's the usual situation. A student does the work and the faculty member presents it. Uh, so big thanks to Julian Kirsch for actually doing all of the real work. Uh, let's start with uh, what is Hacienda? Hacienda is a GCHQ program, uh, their port scanner. Uh, some of you might be familiar with port scanners where you can sc send packets to computers to see how he's responding, uh, to figure out uh, what services are running, what operating system is running, and so on. And usually you run a port scanner against one of your systems or if your network administrator against one of your networks. Um, and of course, a security service uh, likes to run those against an entire country. You know, always a question of scale, as we have seen with most of the uh, revelations in recent years. Now, they, in, at that point in time when they made those slides, and we can presume that this is when the program was relatively new, uh, had only scanned 27 countries, and were in process of finishing another five. Uh, so the first question you might ask is, so how do they decide which country to scan? What's the process? Uh, the answer is very easy. Somebody sends an email to the right address, and they scan a country for them. You know, always good to have oversight. Uh, similar, how do you get access to the data? You know, just sign up. Uh, what information do they gather? Well, they do the usual things that a port scanner does. It pulls back the host name, banners of applications so they know what versions are running, is the port open, filtered, closed, and so on. Um, and for some of the more common protocols, they get additional information like directory listing, content of the main page, RPC info. So it goes a bit beyond what you would typically say a uh, minimal invasive port scan does. Now, you might say it's you know, the usual thing. They like to have data. But what is really important is how is it used. And so we found this interesting slide which says, OK, they're using it for CNE, orb detection, SD. And you go, OK, what on earth do these mean? Right? And we first go in and then, OK, uh, CNE, computer network exploitation, kind of an idea. Uh, SD, SIGDEV, OK, kind of an idea. But what is ORPS? Right. But anyway, let's start with SD. And uh, so we have another wonderful help from the NSA explaining to us what really SIGDEV is. And they explain this with the same set of slides that you might see in a nice course by Tanya or Amir, uh, which is, you know, they start thinking like the bad guys. Reconnaissance, infection, command and control, and exfiltration. So the RICE principle. How does this look like? Well, reconnaissance, get publicly available information, like people's passwords. You know that they're public, right? Um, <laughs> and once you have those, you find out what is the target victim's network like, scan it. This is where Hacienda comes in. Find out what the operating systems and the versions are. Um, and you know, then you get back this information from Hacienda, for example. And then you infect the machine. For example, by sending zero-day exploits to the target system, right? Or you try out the passwords. I hope your passwords are stronger than this weak one here, right? Um, and once you have successfully compromised the system, you control it. You send over your tools to the target system to really establish a good foothold, right? Looks then like this, right? I own the machine, and then finally, the victim's data is your data. Now, notice very clearly. They don't write NSA here, but they mean NSA here, right? So it's, it's a good way of understanding how they think of themselves. OK, so uh, that was SD. Now, to figure out what uh, ORBs are, we had to ask our Canadian friends. Uh, ORBs are operational relay boxes. So they are used as a covert infrastructure to provide an additional level of non-attribution subsequently used for ex exploits and exfiltration. In other words, when you use the Tor network to hide yourself, you use some volunteer's computer to redirect your traffic through. When the NSA or GCHQ or CSEC want to hide themselves, they use some non-volunteer's computer to hide themselves behind. <laughs> right? Now, in the Tor case, we have then things like the Tor exonerator, which can say, look, this was a Tor node. You know, it is relaying traffic for other people, so if you think he's the ha evil hacker that broke into your system, don't sue him because he's just running a Tor node. He's a volunteer. Now, what happens to you if they orbed your machine and you became an operational relay box involuntarily, and then comes some police agency, knocks on your door and says, you evil hacker broke into this company and stole their secrets, and you go, <laughs> what? <laughs> 
Right? You wouldn't even, you know, with the case of Tor, you can know, oh, yeah, please call my lawyer here. If I've set it all up, I'm volunteering here. In the case that they hack you, well, it's going to be an interesting legal position you're in now. Um, what's also interesting is, so, so how do they go about getting orbs? Well, they have a focused effort two to three times a year where they one day they go and get as many orbs as possible. And then they talk about, yeah, we've you know, got a couple of thousand orbs in this one-day exercise. Uh, but they are spies and computer scientists, and so they're lazy. Right? And so they complain that it was still manual, the process of effectively going through the results from Hacienda. You can see here Hacienda, and finding out which services are vulnerable, which computers are compromised. And as computer scientists, what do we do if it's two laborers? We automate it. Right? So they automated the entire process, and when then the NSA came to the Canadian and said, hey, we want to hack that network provider. Can you find us how we get in? Five minutes later, they said, these are all the vulnerable systems we can take over because they had hooked up the output from Hacienda with the knowledge about which zero days they could use to exploit the systems. And effectively, we were able to just immediately generate a list of, here's how you get in. All right, so your government funds are well spent here. What's the overall goal? Well, uh, again, let's go back to the British here. Automatically understand everything important about target networks from passive and active sources. What's important here is Hacienda is an active source. So they port scan. That means they do, they do have some activity here. But we should never forget, they also just look at traffic that flows through the internet. So they can also passively see that something is running, right? And you know, understand everything important about all machines from the internet from passive and active sources. So all machines may sound pretty harmless, but please, when you see this, think about the internet of creepy things. Right? So this will include your fridge and your pacemaker. So, it's all lost. Yeah, sorry, I'm a bit of a German background here. <laughs> so we looked at solutions for this because we don't want to just frustrate people. Um, and so I'm going to talk about briefly two possible solutions. The first one is the backwards compatible minimally invasive hotfix. So when you saw the previous one, you know, taping over MD5, you know, think of it that way. Uh, and then we can also do, you know, what we really do as scientists, how we really solve this. Now, the interesting thing is the hotfix kind of goes back to research from, I think it was like 2000 around, but possibly a bit older, it's a bit hard to pinpoint it, which is port knocking. So the basic idea when you do a port scan is you send a SYN packet to a port, right? So this is the attacker here sending it to a service. And if nothing is running on the service, you get back a reset packet. Now, when we enable port knocking, even though a service is running, what our host should just do is also send back the reset packet. So that for the attacker, it looks like there's nothing running. The basic idea of port knocking was then, in order to get access to the service, we first have to send packets to a different port, like 4242, get back a reset packet, send packets to another port, like 1337, Again, back better reset. And then magically, when we then contact the real port, it opens up and we get the confirmation, yeah, there's something running and we can talk to it. That was the basic idea of port knocking. You know, just send some traffic to other ports that contain some secret values, and then magically the host opens up the administrative port. Notice this is to protect administrative services. If you're running a public web server that everybody is supposed to access, this is not going to be helpful. Right? But of course, the services that are most interesting for compromise are the ones where you have administrative logins and controls that should be only reserved to certain uh, people anyway. And so for those, you can effectively share the secret handshake, so to speak, and then give them access. Now, what's the problem with this? Well, remember we said GCHQ looks at passive sources? So this is kind of visible, right? If I do that kind of handshake first, they'll just see, ah, <laughs> let me send the same thing, and then they get into. Right? So we need to find something that's a bit more stealthy. So our design goals were to be stealthy, so that it's not easy to see this when they look at the passive traffic, um, should be reasonably secure, and practical as in, you should be able to deploy this with today's internet infrastructure. Don't just say, oh, let's revamp the whole thing, right? Now, if you look at the TCP SYN packet, the only place where we can be stealthy is the sequence number. Most of the fields in this initial SYN packet here have some very specific fixed meaning. But the sequence number is specified to be random. And oh, do we like randomness as crypto people, right? Um, turns out, in, in practice, random here means for the Linux kernel, for example, that the Linux kernel has a host secret, and they hash it, and then they derive from this MD5 hash. 
the 32-bit sequence number. Um, so since this is random, we can put in any other random value, like something from a shared secret. So first simple design, suppose we have some pre-shared key between the administrator who is authorized to access the system and the host itself. Um, and we're going to take the destination address, the destination port, and the TCP timestamp, hash those together, get what we call an authentication security token, and we just use that as the ISN. If the ISN matches all of these things, including the pre-shared secret, the server grants access. If it doesn't, it refuses access. The handshake looks exactly like every other TCP handshake on the net. If the NSA just looks at all handshakes, they can't flag it all as, as suspicious, presumably, because there's lots of TCP handshakes. So this is reasonably stealthy. But there's a little problem here. There's a little program here called Second Date, where they are exploiting the well-known man-in-the-middle attack. So if I do this handshake with the secret, nothing guarantees me that the NSA doesn't let the handshake pass and then afterwards takes over the TCP connection using their routers in the middle. Right? So the moment I do authenticate, they just steal my connection. So, slight variation. We introduce also the payload that we're going to send first as part of what we're hashing. So, we have a payload integrity protector, which is the payload concatenated with our shared secret. We call this IH. And the authentication security token, which is based on the same things as before and IH. And we use as the ISN the concatenation of those two values. What is the result? When the host gets the packet, it first checks, is the AV correct? If not, port closed. If it is correct, OK, port open. Now we send our payload, or the NSA sends the attack payload. If the IH of the, on the payload is correct, we give it to the application. If it's incorrect, we close the connection and reset it. Which means the first bits of payload can be protected. Now, if it's a well-designed protocol, and that's, of course, a big if, where the client starts by sending its public key, right, or a fingerprint of its public key, and afterwards we continue with the cryptographic handshake and make sure everything is authenticated and encrypted, then the NSA can't get into the traffic in the middle and start to send whatever their zero-day exploits are. So that's the high-level idea. Couple of things. Contrary to some previous designs, we do not include the source IP and the port in the ISN generation uh, because that improves compatibility with network address translation. So when you have a router at home uh, that performs NAT translation, you want to still be able to use this to connect to your server. And so if we don't include the source IP and port, uh, then th this works with these kind of NAT devices. Um, in return, to make the result more random, we do include the TCP timestamp if available because that way we still get random or high entropy ISN values. We also implemented this in the kernel, which has the advantage that you don't have to fiddle with config files, set up complicated daemons, and so on, and it makes it easier to use for applications. Now, I was told never show source code in presentations, so I regularly do. Uh, here's an example for a simple TCP server. This is kind of what you would usually do to create a TCP socket. Um, here's our shared secret, and this Six lines are what you would have to add, including error checking, to enable TCP stealth, which is, you say, here's the shared secret, right? And this is the number of bits I want, or bytes I want to integrity protect. Just set those two socket options. If you have a supporting kernel, you're done. Same thing on the client side, except this time you don't uh, uh, set the length of the integrity protected bits, but just the exact payload. All you have to do. Now, people told us that was still too much work. Um, so we wrote a shared library called libnockify, which you can preload using like this before your actual program, and then you can take any legacy program, and the library will insert those calls after you create the TCP socket automatically for you. And it will even be rather tricky in handling cases where you don't have the payload yet. It'll just wait and defer the connection handshake before the, until the application gives you the payload, so it handles those cases also, uh, which is rather awesome, but uh, also rather complicated to do right. Um, and the options like the shared secret are given as environment variables, so re you really can use this with any legacy TCP application without even recompiling it. 
what are the limitations? Well, first limitation, we have to distribute the pre-shared key. So if you have a large user base, you know, thousands of people, that won't work. But usually you don't want to uh, have stealthy servers for that kind of large user base anyway. And of course, the ISN and TCP has only 32 bits. So the security you get from this is, well, you know, now the NSA has to send 4 billion packets to do your port scan successfully. Somewhat better, you know, right now they can scan the entire internet in like 45 minutes. With this, it might still take a couple of decades. So a significant improvement. Uh, there's, of course, also still the possibility that the metal box might change the ISN or the TSVEL. And we found some existing study that effectively says in about 93% of the cases, it will work the way we do it. And only in some of the other cases, uh, the scheme will still be destroyed by NAT boxes. Um, the percentages are higher for well-known services like HTTP and HTTPS, which ISPs love to man in the middle you on more st strongly than uh, for random ports. But of course, we are mostly interested in ports that are administrative, so they are not those ports where we come and encounter proxies. Biggest problem? We proposed this to the IETF in a draft. We proposed this to the Linux community in a patch. We proposed this to the FreeBSD community in a patch. And they have so far pretty much failed to take it on. Uh, the IETF uh, says uh, uh, it has nothing to do with security, so we're not responsible. The Linux community has gigantic discussions about technical details that are totally no problem. Um, and the FreeBSD community doesn't even respond to the email. <sighs> okay. Uh, to summarize, uh, we have a problem that the NSA is sending us zero days after, of course, they have, they have to do some reconnaissance. We could not stop the zero days unless we magically find a way to never have vulnerable software in our servers and have even longer passwords and everything. So we can't stop the zero days, but we could stop the reconnaissance. And if you can't connect to the service, you can't exploit it. But somehow we have an institutional problem of getting this through. Other problem, Hacienda is a port mapper. So mapper, hmm, what else does the NSA map? So we asked our friends at The Intercept. And there's this nice little program called Treasure Map, which you know, mapped the entire internet, any device, anywhere, all the time. So Hacienda targets TCP servers. They also care about your clients, right? your routers, everything, every device, as we have heard before. And uh, well, we can again try to piecemeal, try to find ways to fix this protocol and that protocol. Or my suggestion is, uh, uh, shared by some others, it's maybe time to build a GNU network. Um, the basic thing looks like this. We start, you know, to give it a simple illustration, with, this is what the internet looks like, right? <laughs> you don't like the internet like this? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know, yes, your mom only knows this part maybe, but uh, uh, so, so start with it like this. Uh, we don't want to rebuild the physical infrastructure. It's a bit too expensive to propose to start with that. Right? So let's suppose we just take whatever we have right now, any way to communicate, and we just assume, well, this is you know, insecure, uh, uh, but just may sometimes get us from point A to point B, and we have no control which points are going to be allowed in this. Um, then we're going to put OTR over that. So what we call the core layer in GNU-NET is uh, the off-the-record protocol, effectively, uh, with an ephemeral diffie uh, key exchange. Then we put a decentralized routing mechanism using key-based routing on it, uh, where effectively we have some security without trusting administrative policies in getting from A to B for arbitrary A and B. Then we put end-to-end -end communication over it. For those who know anything, it's you know, SCTP plus Axolotl, another very good messaging protocol. And effectively, you can build TCP stealth with a su sufficient number of bits into that layer immediately so that services aren't visible. Uh, then we replace DNS with the GNU name system, which is a more general PKI, where you have uh, more explicit trust paths and more privacy when you do queries. Um, and then we build applications on it, and this is roughly what we call the GNU-Net. What's the result? Limitations, distribution of the pre-shared key, well, GNU name system can handle that. We have confidential queries. We could put the shared key to access the service as part of the record into the name store. And because it's not public data as in DNS, it's you are looking it up so you're authorized to see it, um, we can actually distribute the pre-shared key that way. Um, the ISN is only 32 bits. Well, it's easily solved. Just make it longer. Um, don't have problems with middle boxes anymore. 
and it's all in user space, so we can ignore those communities. Um, of course, there are other issues to address that I couldn't mention in this short talk, so uh, there's more research. So I don't think this is done yet. Uh, if you want more information, GNU.org is the main website for the project. Uh, NOC is the NOC patch if you want to patch your systems. Um, GNU name system is here. Uh, fun stuff on uh, more cowbell. The NSA spying on DNS is at MCB. Um, I want to thank, uh, of course, again, Julian and Jacob and a bunch of other people for contributing to this work. Um, and I'll post my slides. Now I'm ready for questions. Thank you. That uh, was full of ideas, this talk. Nice. Uh, we have actually lots of time for questions. There should be another microphone somewhere. Yes, there at the back is a microphone. So how do we get from here to there, assuming that all those organizations and governments are not going to be supportive? Well, part of it is, of course, that by being an overlay, we can effectively say you don't have to support us. We can just deploy it as software, so as long as you aren't effectively able to prevent us from running free software on our computers, it might be a bit hard for them to stop it if we do it right. It's maybe a bit tough to get it funding and built and uh, bug free and all of those things. But I, I, you know, free software is a bit hard to stop. Right? Microsoft has seen this uh, in the past that you know, it's, uh, once it's one, running well uh, and it's free, it's a bit hard to, you know, for people not to take it. Um, the other thing is I don't think that everybody in government is necessarily on the bad side on this. And there are some solutions that we can convince governments that they want this. Uh, so I still hope that we can convince some governments that defense is the better option, that in offense they will always lose. So best answer I can give. If you have a better one, let me know. Jake? <laughs> Are we really done with the IETF? I, I mean, did we really give up, I guess, is my... I didn't realize we'd quit. Are we, done with the, are we done with the ITF was the question. Um, well, I submitted it to draft, two drafts, and you know we have had uh, lots of fun with both. And it's work to write a reasonable draft. And if they then don't kill it on technical grounds, which I would understand if they say, look, this is bad technically, but rather kill it on procedural grounds or saying, oh, this is not aligned with our politics, yeah, I'm pretty much done. You know, I like to still tease them, but uh, I don't see a value in trying to pursue that process. You know, what's the benefit? We have documented it. If you don't want to publish the documentation, well, it's still documented. On the previous slide, you were saying there's lots of research to be done, and I know that you had some ideas of more possible, uh, positive sounding words that you kicked out in favor of questions. More what? More positive, positive sounding things that you kicked out. Oh, you out wanted the hope of. slide. <laughs> Okay, I'll give well, you the hope slide. if there's a hope. <laughs> so here's my hope slide. So in the recent years, we learned about a bunch of spy programs, like Trackfin, Treasure Map, Hacienda, Bullrun, Jewel, UCD, RBG, or Long Haul, and so on. And you know, they targeted various systems, be it Swift and Visa, be it the internet overall, be it TCP services we talked about today. And the interesting thing is, for each of these systems, we had an answer on the research side. Uh, here, the answer is NA because the answer is simply don't use it, right? <laughs> um, and the other interesting thing is those things have all been done, you know, way, 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 way before we ever heard about the NSA or, or other programs. So the community has answers. The problem is they may either not be polished enough to be really widely adopted or the other side is successfully preventing them from being adopted, right? But the good answer is also for the people who are not technical, yes, the community has answers. If you ask the right people, you will get answers to these problems. We can solve them on a technical level, but we can't necessarily solve them on an organizational political level to make sure that they get uh, into the world because, let's say, this community in particular may not be the best at commercializing these things.
Hi. Um, how much would the whole solution increase the traffic and how much uh, would it decrease your performance? I mean, concerning if it would be globally deployed. That depends a lot on the very specific part of the solution you're looking at. So if you look at the GNU name system, uh, I would expect that we get better caching, but slightly larger messages, maybe two or three times. Now, for DNS traffic, two or three times larger messages, but better caching, which one is going to be more? <laughs> you can't, it depends so much on usage patterns, almost impossible to predict, really. Um, for other things, uh, the increases are way smaller. Right? So if you, you know, take uh, encrypt this uh, packet, uh, doesn't really add to the bytes, and the CPU consumption for encryption, symmetric encryption is so cheap these days, it's irrelevant. But then we have solutions where we really use secure multi-party computation, homomorphic encryption, secret sharing, all in the GNU system already, where, of course, yeah, if I do this with secure multi-party computation, it's going to be orders of magnitude more expensive, uh, but at the endpoints. Now, most of our endpoints these days are rather idle. Right? So you, you will not see too many client systems that run at 100% CPU on average. Uh, so if you double your CPU consumption, you as the end user today may not even really notice. Right? So because it becomes peer-to-peer, -peer, we don't have to worry about this you know, Google server farm having to double its power consumption. Uh, it's really at the end users, which, again, may address some of the scalability problems you might perceive if you go for a centralized solution. So I don't quite think that performance is necessarily going to be a, a real problem here. The problem is uh, changing infrastructure, possibly changing in mindsets, and of course that there are lots of attack vectors that target the user, uh, target the hardware, and those are really hard to address. Uh, can you say something about the interoperability for the transition of this new stack with the old one? How do you see that? I uh, uh, can say a little bit about it. Uh, so one of the applications we can run over GNUnet is called TCP IP, you know, VPN. <laughs> you know, nothing says you can't write TCP IP on top of it. Uh, so that's kind of the end game. Uh, you know, internet is obsolete, but you can run it in legacy mode on top. Um, the GNU name system can interoperate with DNS. You can uh, uh, use an application that expects to speak the DNS protocol and send queries to the GNU name system on a gateway, and then it converts them to GNS queries, and the replies can con be converted back. Um, Others are uh, rather radically disruptive, as in, you know, you can't uh, uh, deploy uh, a new decentralized social network uh, and expect to interoperate with Facebook, right? In part, the problem is whenever you want good privacy in communication between two parties, both parties have to support it, right? So don't expect there's going to be a new metadata-protecting uh, messaging system that's going to be co compatible with SMTP email. You know, you can't have both, right? Or you get the security of the weaker of the two solutions, which is what we definitely don't want. Asking questions is not exclusively for people on the right, so I'm happy that we now have one from the left side. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering, let's say I'm an, uh, an app developer, an Android or iOS app developer, and I want to include a GNU network for uh, communication. How easy would that be? You're an Apple or an app developer? App developer. Ah, okay, app developer, that's better. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we did is we effectively modularized the entire stack through APIs. So that each of these layers has a clean, well-defined C API that you can call to access the respective functions that it provides. Um, and there's also a, a network protocol, which is typically run on loopback. Uh, so if you don't write it in C, you could theoretically say, I want to have my application written in pure Java or pure Python or whatever, and then just speak the, the Unix domain socket or TCP protocol to access the service. Um, and then you can effectively, all of these are separate processes, so your application will be a separate process just using this existing API to do its communication. So it is relatively easy. The big problem is that the moment you do that, you ask your users to install our software first. Uh, and that is not necessarily the easiest process for most people at this point. Uh, you know, something to work on. You could include it with, with the app itself. Uh, then you get one of these big apps. So uh, some people ask me, so how big is the whole thing? And I go and say, well, if I natively compile the whole thing on, on Windows, where I really have to drag in all of the dependencies, I need like 10 gigabytes. <laughs> uh, that's because we also have things like tech in the dependency set for some document generation. And, uh, <laughs> uh, 
you know, G -G 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 GTK isn't small and a bunch of crypto libraries aren't small, you know, GNU TLS and so on. So the answer is these things tend to be not tiny. Now, if you say I only need a tiny fraction of your system, lots of these dependencies are optional. You know, we can, uh, in our case, we have a, a dependency on, uh, uh, I think it's uh, libav codec from VLC, you know, one of these big video players because we can use this to extract metadata from files you might want to be transferring, and so we can ship that metadata first before we transfer the big file. Now, that's optional. You don't have to have all of these features. But now you as the app developer have to kind of carve out which part of the system you really need. Uh, that's going to be a lot of work. <laughs> all right. So the answer is it can run on really small devices, uh, but if you want all the features, it can be rather big. One of the things that worries me in such a huge effort is that during the first few years, it's likely to be riddled with lots of bugs. Uh, you are describing now uh, something which is going to replace almost any element of the uh, stack, and uh, it's comparable to building an operating system with a small team of volunteers and initially deployed in a small number of locations. Aren't you worried that uh, it will actually introduce a lot more security bugs at the beginning before it is carefully uh, uh, developed and looked at. So anyone who will volunteer to put it uh, initially is going to put himself as a big, at a bigger risk. Uh, I should first mention, I guess, that we started this in 2000. So saying initially is already a bit, you know, for me, oh my god. <laughs> um, uh, secondly, uh, team small, well, I think the IRC channel has typically like 55 people on it, and most actually are developers. Uh, we, we did some survey, and we found out we had more developers than we had people running the code uh, at some point. It was very funny to find out. Um, but uh, uh, there's, of course, certainly always the risk when you have new software uh, that it might have vulnerabilities. So one of the things we've been doing is, as I said, we have every one of these boxes, in fact, many more, is a separate Unix process. So in the whole system, if you run it, you have like 50 or 60 of those at this point. And for each of these processes, they have a very well-defined thing that they should do. And so what you could do, and what we would want to do, is that you say this process only has the following system calls it's allowed to do. It can only read these files, or it cannot read any files. It can only communicate over the network, or it cannot communicate over the network. And so by having very fine-grained compartmentalization and hopefully an operating system that is a bit more mature than ours, that can actually enforce that the compartmentalization is hard, um, we can kind of limit the impact of a security problem. The other thing is all of these processes, when they, while they communicate with each other, they don't trust each other. All right, so this, <laughs> it's an API, I'm being called over the network, and so even though it's typically a loopback network on the same system, I treat it as potentially the other guy is really just trying to hack me here. All right, so that's how the code has been written defensively. So those are the things I can say in defense, right? And we try to keep it simple and well-engineered and all of that. Um, but yes, of course, early adopters uh, have not the perfect security we would like. Uh, in particular, you don't get a good anonymity set. You know, if you only have five users, you're not going to have as much anonymity as if you have, you know, half, half, half a million from Tor. Uh, so I would never say that this is the system that people should use today uh, uh, for perfect privacy. But I think that this is something we as society need to build. And if you say, well, you have a small development team, join us, <laughs> start hacking. Um, uh, that's the best way the community can push this forward. Um, yeah. <laughs> so volunteers? Volunteers. <laughs> we have time for another question. Yeah, there's one. Are there um, any examples we can run today? So like a simple web page or something, or IRC server, client, something? Uh, okay, you're already using bad terms. Uh, I, I, first of all, instead of client server, just use master slave. Right? It, it represents the, the term much better. We don't like client server. You don't want, we don't want to run a web server in the end. Because that, again, means I'm sending my data to somebody else, right? So, so, no, you could run the web server in the legacy TCP IP over GNUnet model, right? But that's not really where you want to be. So applications that work uh, include file sharing and anonymous file sharing. You, you can use the GNU name system. Uh, the problem is that now you have a PKI, but which applications can support it nicely? Uh, 
you can uh, play around with our uh, voice over Gnu application. That kind of works if your latency is good enough. <laughs> um, and uh, so there will be more applications in the future. Of course, the problem is you need to build it up from the bottom. Right? And you start with the simple application that the simple primitives can support. Uh, we have uh, uh, many primitives in the system that uh, aren't yet used by the applications they're envisioned for. Uh, and some applications, I mean, again, it depends also what kind of person you are, right? If you are uh, uh, hardcore on the, on the development side and you just like to play with cool features, it's different than when you are a real user, right? Yes, one more hand. I think we spotted one there, yes, and you have spotted you. Um, so you mentioned the use of external libraries like the one from VLC. Mm -hmm. um, so don't you think that these have inherent bugs like pointed out, oh, for example, problem. memory corruption exploits? Yes, yeah, so, so, so when we look at uh, 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 this part where we use these external libraries, uh, we run each of these external multimedia libraries in a separate process that we forked off from a, uh, another separate process, so it's twice removed from everything. Right, because we really think that this thing is really bad, mm. <laughs> right? And so you, you you should restrict that in terms of you know which, it, it, the only thing it needs to do is effectively send the metadata back over an IPC channel, mm. um, and so yes, it could crash really badly, right? Uh, I expect it to. Uh, in fact, they do, and we have to you know then restart it automatically and hide the fact that they died 50 billion times on this input. Uh, <laughs> so yes, those are really terrible libraries, and so the answer is again separate processes. Uh, run them in a very isolated way, away from your main application, and hope that the operating system process isolation capabilities are sufficient to contain them. Uh, if they are not, uh, I suspect the system's going to have other vulnerabilities than ours. But of course, it's also optional, right? So if you're really concerned, the answer is don't use those plugins. Right? They're optional. So, so what's the, the part of this stack that's resistant to traffic analysis? Or is it anonymous? Or? Ah, not everything is anonymous, I should mention. Um, but the first thing you get where it kind of becomes a bit resistant to traffic analysis is that everything, all of the different applications, all of the different components are running over this core layer, that's why it's called core, um, which is link encryption. So on the links between the system, a passive adversary from the outside already can't tell. Are you doing file sharing? Are you doing voice? Are you doing name system? Because it's all over the same channel. All right, that's why uh, 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 we had picked this architecture that we want to kind of mix the different traffic. Right? So somebody who has a, an important voice call might still look to the spy agencies as if he's doing file sharing. And you know, Snowden documents told us that they don't like to record file sharing traffic because it's too much garbage for them. So they might think all of this is file sharing. And the file sharing also creates dummy traffic uh, by migrating opportunistically. So file isn't being requested, but we have free bandwidth, so we just send stuff. So that gives you some traffic analysis resistant. Um, now, on the routing layer, uh, we have one anonymous routing protocol, which is GAP. And we plan to have an onion routing protocol also in here. Uh, but it's not finished yet, so I don't put it on the slides. Right? So there are plans for uh, 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 anonymous routing protocols in the system. The other thing is, of course, as I said, you have the traffic resistance here. And of course, we don't just think about anonymity. We also think about other security properties um, that have nothing to do with that. So if I have uh, computation on private inputs, I don't necessarily care about uh, uh, that the other person doesn't know who I am, but they're not supposed to learn some of my private inputs into the computation. So we're taking a bit broader view on privacy and security than just anonymity here. Okay, if there are no more questions, then uh, please join me in thanking Christian again.